I have two questions on the theoretical end of the spectrum, but I think we can get this to where we can talk about why strength training might be useful or interference. Good morning. Happy Monday. I have Neuro Coffee in hand and it is perfect. All right. Lots of things to do today. We're going to dig into a, a, a Q&A. It's going to be a combination of, of two questions. Try to make it useful. Um, some of this is going to be theoretical, so it might be interesting to, to some of you. And then the rest of you, you just turn it off. It's okay. I'm only expecting about five or six views on this one. Um, so we're going to dig into some theoretical first. And this comes from Ryan. <clears throat> and Ryan says... You said that the ability to expand and compress and expand again is a universal principle. Can you give a handful of, of examples in the human body outside of gait or shoulder and hip range of motion? And also, can you name some examples in the natural world and the universe? I warned you. Okay. This is actually a fun question for me because um, I do like to kind of talk about some of this stuff. But Ryan, one of the things you have to recognize is that everything about you is a compression, compression and expansion. So let's just look at your heart. And I think everybody has a, a representation in their head when they're looking at a heart beating. They understand that blood flows into the heart, it expands, it compresses, and then the blood flows out. And the, by the way, the heart doesn't pump it out. That's a different story. Um, but everything inside of you is gonna be based on compression expansion. So the peristalsis that moves the, the lunge through your gut is, is, is compression expansion. If we look at something local, like muscular contraction. So if I concentrically oriented muscle, there's actually a higher pressure um, within that muscle. So the intramuscular pressure is higher as we reduce the concentric orientation. We have a reduction um, in, in pressure there as well. So again, we always have compression expansion um, taking place somewhere at some time. It all depends on where we're looking. We're also going to see this as, as global strategies. So every movement that you have is going to have some some peak moment of, of force output, which would be representative of the, the compressive strategy. To what degree is then dependent on, on what you're doing? You know, if you're drinking a glass of water, it's not gonna be your maximum um, peak force that you could, you could produce, but there is going to be a peak in that moment in time. If I'm doing a vertical jump, it's a little bit easier to, to see that representation of, of, of that peak moment. Um, so again, so every sporting movement is going to have this, this expansion to compression to expansion representation. If we're talking about a high jump, the moment that the high jumper plants his foot into the ground, there's going to be a, a peak resultant. And then as he leaves the ground, he's going to, going to re-expand. Um, sprinter, same thing, hitting the ground, compression to expansion. If I'm throwing a baseball, there's a moment in time where everything squeezes tight, time stops, and I produce this maximum output of force. It's just very, very brief. And so we don't see these things because our, our eyes just just can't stop time to, to recognize that but we can see these things we can measure these things in like force plates and, and we can watch it on video and such so Ryan everything becomes this this compression to expansion to compression if we look at, at the, the universal principles if you will we can get really off the deep end here and we can say that okay space-time has a very specific shape that looks like that and that's called a light cone because light behaves the same way time behaves the same way space the influence of gravity etc all play into this sort of expansion compression expansion um, if you were if you were theoretically near a black hole you would probably recognize this shape as well um, so again this is all theoretical physics stuff which is way above my pay grade but anyway it makes this a nice representation when we talk about our external rotation and, and, and internal rotation representations of, of how we move. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna expand that, that point where I have the, the meeting of the two cones a little bit so I can show you where this internal rotation moment is. And now we can start to influence this. So now we're gonna to go to Andrew's question. So Andrew says, for someone who's looking to optimize performance or, or hypertrophy, you say that there's often a trade-off that occurs between muscle hypertrophy and general movement capabilities, given the compression that is created with muscle hypertrophy. Um, however, I know you use bilateral squats, and I'm sure other symmetrical exercises in your programs is the advantage of bilateral movements, simply that they're easier to standardize and teach, allowing for quicker learning and more accurate tracking, or am I missing something? Okay, 
So when we're using bilateral symmetrical activities, which, which are higher load, higher force capabilities, our goal is to increase that moment of time where we can produce force. And so, so as we add weight to the bar, as we're using these, these bigger movements, our goal is to teach ourselves to, to achieve that, that element of maximum force output, maximum compression. And as long as we're increasing our force and it doesn't interfere with anything else, then, then we've got a very, very useful strategy for training here. Now, the, the, the byproduct of this though is I'm increasing compression which slows down time. So it increases the duration that I am in this internally rotated force producing position. And so if, if by adding my ability to produce force requires that I increase the amount of time that I utilize that. So now I've extended this period where I'm, where I'm producing force and I actually slow down, where I actually reduce my velocity, where I needed velocity, I have now created interference. And, and so that's when force production can become detrimental. It, 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 it just simply interferes with our ability to, to represent that one moment in time where I have this maximum peak force output that has to occur very briefly. So, you know, if, if I was a golfer, and I extended the duration of the of the amount of force that I was I was trying to put out. I actually slowed down the the club head because what I want is I want that peak to be recognized at a, a very very brief moment in time um, that allows the highest possible force production. Um, if I have to reduce the field of external rotation that I have available to me, which is representative of, of the amount of motion that I need to demonstrate ranges of motion or velocity. If I have to compress that to increase my force production, I have now again created an interference. So, so bilateral symmetrical exercises are, are well designed to increase my ability to produce a compressive strategy, which allows me to increase my, my peak forces at the right time. Um, hypertrophy is a byproduct of that. Hypertrophy by itself, um, again, to develop any significant amount of hypertrophy, there's going to be some compressive strategies associated, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's interference. Um, so again, the way that we figure this stuff out, um, uh, Andrew, is that we train people. And so we actually have to do things and we determine what is the best course of action. And so we have to have some form of key performance indicator that is going to allow us to determine whether we're on the right path or not. So if I'm trying to improve someone's acceleration, so let's say that I'm measuring their, 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 their acceleration through a, a, a 10 meter um, sprint from, from a, a standing start, I take them into the gym, I train them, I bring them back and I retest retest that, that 10 meter sprint. And if that continues to improve, then my strategy in the weight room is good. And so if I'm using bilateral symmetrical activities to do that, great. But at some point in time, and maybe it happens and maybe it doesn't, at some point in time, it can become interference. The only way that you can tell whether this is going to happen is as you train them. And again, this is why we monitor key performance indicators. So if I increase force production, if I reduce my, my extra rotation field, but I don't need that range of motion to perform my activity, then again, I'm not creating interference. So all of these activities are great activities. We use them all the time. We have to buy bigger trap bars um, because we have people that can pull so much weight that we don't have enough room to put the weights on. And so again, these are not bad things. Bilateral symmetrical activities are very, very useful at certain times for certain people in certain circumstances. What you have to do is you have to understand that this is always an N equals one experiment. And we're talking about an, an individual here and then their response to training. So again, we've always got the expansion compression expansion on the table as a representation of movement. We superimpose force production on top of that to determine what is going to be the best course of action under a specific context. So guys, I hope that answers a little bit of your question for you. I realize this is very theoretical, kind of off the beaten path. Anyway, we'll come back tomorrow with, with more fun. Have a great day and I'll see you tomorrow.